Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, you're welcome to this uh, third webinar from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine on the EU deforestation regulation. Uh, I'm Paul Savage. I'm the Assistant Secretary General here at the Department with responsibility for forestry and for the coordination of the response on the uh, on the deforestation regulation. Uh, and I'm joined by colleagues uh, who will be both presenting in the course of the webinar this afternoon and also, uh, as necessary, responding to any particular questions that people may have following on from the previous webinars that we've held. Um, so just by way of uh, general note, I suppose, at the moment, that you've uh, already been circulated with the agenda, which will include an update on the latest developments, including the announcement from the European Commission that it's uh, moving to defer the commencement of the regulation until the 30th of December 2025, so pushing it back by 12 months. Um, but in fairness, that's been, I think, due to the fact that we were still awaiting information, uh, guidance notes, uh, frequently asked questions, also information in relation to the use of the Commission's IT system. And obviously, the late advent of that information has meant that they've had to put the, uh, the, the deadline back. But I think it's probably fair to say that there's an awful lot of work to do still uh, between now and the end of next year. So from the department's point of view, uh, this is not an opportunity for us to take our foot off the pedal um, by any means. We would like to continue and we will be maintaining our own momentum here in terms of uh, meeting with stakeholders, conducting further webinars as we go through the process, uh, and of course developing any further questions or issues that have arisen on foot of the Commission's guidance note and, uh, and frequently asked questions, and even the use of the Commission's uh, IT system as well. So there's a lot of work to do uh, over the next 12 months and, and 14 months in fact, and we intend to, to continue this regular engagement and to hopefully maintain momentum over the coming period and try and make sure that we have our arrangements in place well in advance if we can uh, of December 2025. So just to make that broad, uh, I suppose, general point for the moment. Uh, also, you'll have seen that we did put up frequently asked questions or added further frequently asked questions to our own FAQ on our website following on from the last two webinars. Uh, we'd hope to do that similarly after today. If there are any further questions that we haven't already covered, uh, we'll do that uh, ourselves on, on the website and that hopefully will complement what the Commission is also doing as far as frequently asked questions is concerned. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, and we also hope, and I might mention it again at the end, we hope to uh, maybe engage in a more bilateral way or certainly maybe in a more uh, direct way with uh, particularly representative organisations over the next couple of months. And we hope to start that more collective, direct engagement with people uh, probably in early December before we have our next webinar, which is taking place on the 16th. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that and refer to that briefly later on before we wrap up. Um, so that's really by way of introduction. Um, you, as I say, you've got the agenda um, circulated to you. So we have uh, two main items really. Um, one is the update, which will be given in a moment by my colleague uh, Patrick Nolte. Uh, then we have, uh, we're going to share some information that we've got from the Commission, videos on the information system and on how to submit a due diligence statement. And then we'll have an opportunity to take and answer any questions that we can uh, at the end of those couple of presentations. So that's okay, I'm going to hand over then, first of all, to my colleague, Patrick Nutty, who's going to take us through that uh, update on the most recent developments across a, a range of elements, I think it's fair to say, of our implementation schedule. And uh, I'll hand over to Patrick uh, to do that now. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you very much, Paul, and good afternoon to everybody who's on the call today. Um, I'll just check that you can all see the, the screen in front of you, the presentation. Yeah, we can see that, Patrick. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, my uh, presentation today is really to bring us all up to speed on uh, the latest developments with respect to the EU deforestation regulation. And as Paul mentioned in his introduction, there have been quite a number of very significant developments that I think will be of relevance to all of you on the call today. Um, and that's on your screen there, a broad outline of the structure of today's presentation. We're going to look at the new entry into application dates and their implications, some updates on the country benchmarking process, the, the, the new iteration of the frequently asked questions published by the European Commission, their formal guidance note, an update on the information system, and then maybe look at what the next steps you might wish to take as an operator or as an organization advising operators and also what we as a department intend to do to progress air preparations as competent authority for this regulation. So as you're aware perhaps on October the 2nd 
the Commission proposed that the entry into application of the regulation for the EUDR be extended by 12 months. That means that the regulation wouldn't enter into application until the 30th of December 2025 and June 2026 for small and micro enterprises. In order to formally confirm this, legislation is required at EU level and this has been approved by the European Council and that legislation has now been sent to the European Parliament for their approval where a formal vote will take place. Um, I think it's fair to say this extension was requested by numerous stakeholders at the multi-stakeholder platform on deforestation, by partner third countries and indeed by many EU member states. It is important to recall that the core requirements of the EU deforestation regulation have not changed and will not change. Uh, the, the commodities that the regulation applies to will still need to be deforestation free, legally sourced and accompanied by a due diligence statement when operators place those products on the EU market or export them from the EU market as of the 30th of December 2025. Next, to give an update on the country benchmarking process, the European Commission have stated that the country benchmarking process will be published and completed no later than the 30th of June 2025. Um, they've also published a strategic framework for international cooperation with producer countries and partner third countries, and they've made clear in their press statements when publishing the various pieces of document that in their view the, the methodology that will be employed to designate countries low standard or high risk will mean that a large majority of countries worldwide will be classified as low risk and um, this will mean that operators sourcing their products from low risk countries will be able to avail of the simplified due diligence procedures under article 2 of the regulation. Um, we feel, um, in our view, that it's, it's almost certain that EU member states will be designated low risk and we as, as a department certainly consider Ireland to be a low risk country when it comes to deforestation as defined by the EU deforestation regulation. Um, the frequently asked questions published on October the, set, over the, October the 2nd was obviously an eagerly awaited document. It has 10 different sections covering a range of topics such as traceability, scope, the subject of obligations for, for operators and traders, definitions, what due diligence involves, supporting information, timelines, penalties and miscellaneous questions. There are over 100 questions answered in the FAQs and a, a point I will return to later is that we really would strongly encourage you to familiarize yourself with this document. Chances are uh, the questions that you may have will be addressed either directly or tangentially by those FAQs and it is a really comprehensive document. Um, there are some new questions included and I just want to draw your attention to them because there were issues I think that came up in previous webinars such as the issue of mixing of goods, the date and time range of production, the responsible responsibilities of non-SME traders, um, the ability of due diligence statements to now cover multiple shipments, and, and how products can be proven to have been produced prior to the entry into force of the regulation. So they're all addressed in the FAQs. And I think it's a very valuable resource. Secondly, the Commission has published its formal guidance note, and this is a legally um, based guidance note published by the European Commission that has approval from the Commission. Again, it's a very detailed document that clarifies a number of issues that were points of concern for operators and traders. I just want to draw your attention to Annex 1 of the guidance note which sets out a number of different case study scenarios, which I think are particularly useful in giving a kind of real world flavor to how the regulation may operate in practice. 
and Annex 2 of the regulation provides examples of the type of information and due diligence requirements uh, that comp composite products may need to abide by. Um, the Commission have stated that it is a live document which will be updated on an ongoing basis. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, in our view, the, the steer and the information provided in the guidance notes, coupled with the FAQs, should really form the basis of how you begin to develop your due diligence systems um, as you progress and prepare for the entry into the ap application of the regulation over the next 12 months. Next, moving on to the information system. The European Commission have published a user guide for accessing and navigating the information system. A link is included there in the presentation, which we'll share after this webinar. And we also shared that information previously in email communications with you. And um, we also provided information on the online training that the European Commission um, provided and is providing in October and November. We are aware from feedback from some of you that registration for the November sessions filled up incredibly quickly. I think it was something like 90 minutes. And that's certainly uh, feedback we will be providing to the Commission that in our view, um, more online training sessions should be provided as we move into 2025. And I would encourage you to, to monitor the communications from the Commission on a regular basis. And when we get information as well, we'll share that with you um, as soon as we can and as soon as we receive it. And within the information system, operators can indicate the exact origin of products and materials by drawing areas and, and providing coordinates individually or in bulk for their due diligence statements. Um, in order to simplify the process, and where operators are working with products from multiple locations. There are options for uploading, copying, or reusing um, due diligence information, and coordinates can be provided in bulk in a file using GeoJSON standard format files. <coughs> um, to create a due diligence statement, the operator create, uh, selects the type of product and um, provides information on the system such as the quantity and volume to be uh, contained on their due diligence statements. As mentioned in previous webinars, operators further down the supply chain, such as traders within the EU, can refer back to due diligence statements created previously. And if you are a large operator dealing with many products and suppliers, you'll be able to manage your due diligence statements in bulk using a machine-to-machine -machine connection to the registry via an application programming interface, an API. Um, and details on how to do that are available on the Commission website. Um, and obviously, uh, some IT um, skill will be required um, in, in order to do that. Uh, after my presentation, we'll also be showing information videos um, provided by the European Commission that gives some kind of basic guidance around uploading due diligence statements to the information system. So um, if you are an operator or a non-SME trader as well, what are the next steps that you should take um, as we seek to progress um, readiness for this regulation entering into application? The first thing I would say is to use the 12 month deferral wisely. Um, there is now time and space um, to, to gear up and get ready for the obligations this regulation imposes. So I think it's important to use that time productively. I would strongly encourage um, to, you to study the frequently asked questions and guidance notes in detail. When um, in for training on the information system, further training becomes available if you weren't able to register for the Commission's November sessions. I would encourage you to avail of that. And um, as mentioned in my presentation in our very first webinar, start to begin to develop your due diligence system now. You know your supply chain better than anyone else. Your due diligence system 
um, is around gathering information, assessing risk and mitigating risk. And where countries are going to be designated as low risk, and as I mentioned, we'll know that by June 2025, you will only have to conduct the obligation set out under Article 9 of the regulation, which is around gathering information. Make sure that your uh, supply chains are legally sourced. Um, and in, you know, in thinking about this regulation, be aware that legally forced deforestation free supply chains benefit everybody. They benefit the planet, the consumer and the wider economy. And that's why the, the European Union is introducing this regulation. Illegally harvested timber allows companies or operators not playing by the rules to gain an unfair advantage. So it's in everybody's interests, um, both from an economic and environmental and a social point of view, to make sure that it's only legally harvested and deforestation free timber that's placed on the EU market. <coughs> the FAQs simplify and explain various aspects of the regulation. I think that's really important and why I'd place such a strong emphasis on, on getting familiar with them today. But the core elements of the regulation remain due diligence, geolocation and supply chain traceability. Finally, what will we as a department and as a competent authority be doing? And we are exploring how geolocation data held by the department can be shared with operators um, and where that's possible. We will explore how we can do that, but it is important to remember that the submission of due diligence statements remains the legal duty of the operator um, under the regulation, but we will assist where it's practical to do so, and we're working on that presently. We will continue to hold webinars, um, sectoral meetings and bilateral meetings, um, as Paul mentioned in his introduction, and share information through the website, through email and elsewhere, right throughout 2025. We we'll continue to represent Ireland's position, um, which your feedback will help uh, shape both at the multi stakeholder platform on deforestation and at the European Council. The next meeting of that platform is December 6th. And we're committing to listening to you, the stakeholders, and questions that are not addressed in the FAQs or in the guidance note can still be sent to the Commission on an ongoing basis. And we would still be very keen to hear from you and, and do that where it's appropriate. And as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, the regulation may not be entering into application at the end of this year. We may have a 12 month deferral, but there's still a huge amount of work to do in terms of preparation. Um, and it's vital that we use the time we have now effectively. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, I think that presentation hopefully brings us all up to speed regarding the state of play uh, in relation to this regulation. So thank you very much. And that concludes my presentation. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Patrick. Um, so I think again, very clear uh, that um, we have had obviously quite a bit of information in terms of uh, FAQs, the updating of the FAQs and the guidance note. And as Patrick said, we'd be strongly encouraging people to look at uh, the combination of the two things because we think that gives a pretty comprehensive view now of um, uh, what the direction of travel is here, I suppose, in terms of introducing these arrangements and will form the basis, I think, of the preparations that everybody needs to make over the next 12 to 14 months. And um, as Patrick mentioned, and as I talked about at the start, we will have further engagement with people over the next period of time, including at our next webinar in December. But I think it would be very useful if people could, in the meantime, try and digest all of the detail that's in the FAQs, that, that's in the guidance note, um, uh, and also that you see now on the videos, and they'll be available online as well um, on the, the information system. And to try and distill that as best you can, and, um, and we can look then at whether or not you feel that there are any gaps in that, uh, or whether we can just look at specific areas that maybe uh, that still remain open or, or uh, that uh, have uh, questions that you might have around them um, when we come back again in December. Uh, and equally then, if we can uh, talk in more detail, maybe about some of the more practical elements of things, how we might go about implementation. I think a good understanding of what's in the FAQs and the guidance note would certainly help us to focus maybe in a little bit more detail on some of the more practical considerations that we need to put in place to make sure that people are ready. So, uh, and that'll provide the basis for the work that we carry out over the following 12 months. Um, 
So thanks again for that, Patrick. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, we're going to have uh, a couple of uh, videos which the, the Commission, the European Commission, has put together on the information system and on how to submit a due diligence statement. I think the first one, if I'm not mistaken, is on the uh, the information system itself. Is it or is it on the due diligence statement? I'm not sure, Patrick, in which, which order we're running the two in. Is it the information system first? Yeah, it's on submitting a due diligence statement on the information system. I think um, our IT colleagues are going to run it now in a moment. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to our IT colleagues then to, to run that video. So. How can an economic operator manually create a new DDS in less than 10 clicks? This tutorial explains how an economic operator can manually create a due diligence statement, DDS. Companies have the alternative to make DDS submissions via APIs. Any information used for this video is for demonstration purposes only. The term economic operator refers to the following roles. Importers, exporters are companies that import or export goods and products in scope of the EUDR into or out of the customs territory of the EU. Domestic producers are companies that produce either raw material or manufactured goods, which contain products in scope of the EUDR within the EU. Traders are companies that trade goods and products in scope of the EUDR within the EU. Authorized representatives are companies that act and submit EUDR so DDSs check, on behalf of the other three categories of economic right, operators. To make a submission, you need to be connected as an economic operator in the system. Start by accessing the search facility page, which can be found from the no, documents I menu should. by selecting the EU deforestation entry on the landing page. To create a new DDS, due diligence statement, click the Create button in the top right section above the search field. Then choose the Plus As Operator option from the drop-down list. A new window will appear requesting an internal reference number. This is a free format field to be used by the operators to help identify okay, their DDSs sure internally um, for their own classification the purposes. Is, is if one is not provided of, during audio? the creation of a DDS, the system will generate a default I value. Bought, uh, I can hear the audio. When the new DDS sure is saved for the first time, side, click confirm to proceed. Sure going to be part of the a new statement well. document will appear so with mandatory fields marked with a red star. And we didn't necessarily to add the commodity or product, in select from a list of codes record, using so. the interactive tree structure audio, or by no typing audio. a keyword in the search field to find the desired HS code. Yeah, I'm not getting any audio. After neither, selecting neither the commodity code, colleagues. provide so additional sure mandatory information such as commodity or product description weight and it country of production. I think maybe Click the could, import yeah, button no to upload. It doesn't, doesn't interfere with, with anybody's uh, watching, but I, I can't hear anything, so. Okay, sorry. Okay, How can an economic operator manually create a new DDS in less than 10 clicks? This tutorial explains how an economic operator can manually create a due diligence statement, DDS. Companies have the alternative to make DDS submissions via APIs. Any information used for this video is for demonstration purposes only. The term economic operator refers to the following roles. Importers, exporters are companies that import or export goods and products in scope of the EUDR. So into or out of the customs territory of the EU. Domestic producers are companies that produce either raw material or manufactured goods, which contain products in scope of the EUDR within the EU. Traders are companies that trade goods and products in scope of the EUDR within the EU. Authorized representatives are companies that act and submit EUDR DDSs on behalf of the other three categories of economic operators. To make a submission, you need to be connected as an economic operator in the system. Start by accessing the search facility page, which can be found from the documents menu by selecting the EU deforestation entry on the landing page. To create a new DDS, due diligence statement, click the create button in the top right section above the search field. Then choose the plus as operator option from the drop down list. A new window will appear requesting an internal reference number. This is a free format field to be used by the operators to help identify their DDSs internally for their own classification purposes. If one is not provided during the creation of a DDS, 
the system will generate a default value. When the new DDS is saved for the first time, click Confirm to proceed. A new statement document will appear with mandatory fields marked with a red star. To add the commodity or product, select from a list of codes using the interactive tree structure or by typing a keyword in the search field to find the desired HS code. After selecting the commodity code, provide additional mandatory information such as commodity or product description, weight, and country of production. Click the Import button to upload a geolocation JSON file containing the geolocation of the place of harvest. The location can be either uploaded using a GeoJSON file or input manually. The file needs to be prepared in advance. When opening it, the system will display the data from the JSON document in detail. Click Confirm to continue. Do not forget to enter the country of production, which is a mandatory field. After validating the information, you can save the draft. Click on Save button and confirm the action. Once the DDS is saved as draft, you have three options available. Delete the draft, save any new information added to it, and submit. Please review all information before submitting the document. To do so, click on Submit button and confirm the action. The DDS will be recorded with a DDS reference number generated by the system, which will be visible at the top of the page once the DDS is validated and in status available. This reference number is the one to be used in a customs declaration supporting document code. It is also the number used when adding a reference DDS in the References tab. how to retrieve your DDS and usage of the copy as new function. This tutorial explains how an economic operator can find his DDS in the system and use the function copy as new. Companies have the alternative to make DDS submissions via APIs. Any information used for this video is for demonstration purposes only. The term economic operator refers to the following roles. Importers exporters are companies that import or export goods and products in scope of the EUDR into or out of the customs territory of the EU. Domestic producers are companies that produce either raw material or manufactured goods, which contain products in scope of the EUDR within the EU. Traders are companies that trade goods and products in scope of the EUDR within the EU. Authorized representatives are companies that act and submit EUDR DDSs on behalf of the other three categories of economic operators. To copy as new, you need to be connected as an economic operator in the system. Start by accessing the search facility page, which can be found from the documents menu by selecting the EU deforestation entry on the landing page. The default sort order is by submission date with the newest entry first. Keep in mind that you can only see the DDS that you created for your company. Use the basic search field to search for DDS by reference number or company internal reference. The Advanced Search section allows you to narrow the search using different criteria. Please note that the system offers you the option to create a new DDS using the function Copy as New. Operators importing multiples consignments of similar products can copy their own DDS as new instead of completing all fields again. The Copy as New icon is available from the search result grid. Select the desired DDS entry and proceed. This action is identical to the Create action and will produce a copy of the DDS with status new. All sections will be pre-filled and editable like in a new document. Amend as needed. Once all information is entered, the DDS can be saved and submitted. Uh, thanks, Anthony. I think those that has completed now it's run. Is that correct? Yeah, the both videos are complete now. Great. Thanks for that. And apologies to everybody. Um, we had some issues here in the department uh, not being able to hear 
uh, the contents of the video. We could see the visual uh, presentation, but not the audio. So I, my apologies if I was maybe talking across the, the video because I think you could hear it on the uh, on the public audio. So apologies for that. Uh, hopefully, anyway, you got the uh, the gist of uh, of what was outlined on the videos. And uh, as I said, they will be available online, obviously, to follow up in any event uh, in your own time. Um, so, uh, so I think from our perspective, that's that's kind of a fairly uh, up-to-date presentation in terms of where we currently stand based on latest developments, and obviously uh, the videos we hope will help in that regard as well. Um, so um, we wanted then to open it up to the floor in terms of any questions, um, and uh, there were a couple of points that came in just on on the the questions. You can put them in on the questions tab. Uh, on the uh, on your screens, and uh, we'll try and get to those um, uh, in the time that we have. Uh, I just saw one or two comments about about maybe having also having difficulty hearing the audio. So again, those videos will be available online uh, on the department's website if you want to to uh, have another look at those and rerun them uh, in your own time. Um, there were a couple of questions then that have come in on the uh, on, on the questions list here. One was in relation to whether there's a chance that the EU Parliament or the European Parliament might reject the proposal to defer the implementation by 12 months. Uh, it's always a possibility, but I think it's probably an unlikely possibility given the fact that um, uh, there are groupings within the European Parliament that themselves were calling for an extension uh, of the implementation date or a deferral of the implementation date before the Commission's proposal was presented. Uh, so, like I say, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility, but it's probably unlikely at this stage that, uh, that you would see uh, that uh, rejection of the proposal to extend. Uh, there's a further question here in relation to the definition of a manual. I'm not sure precisely what that was referring to there in terms of uh, manual, in terms of the access to information on, on the operation systems. I don't know, maybe Patrick or Colin or if anybody else had any view on that one, on what the definition of a manual would be. Um, Paul, I'd maybe ask the, the, the individual maybe to provide us a bit more detail by, by email what exactly if the question is seeking to tease out, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure exactly what, what, okay, what, sure. That. But what I will say is that the guidance note published by the Commission is a formal document publication published by the Commission, whereas the FAQs is, if you like, more of a rolling dynamic sharing of information and working through of, of how the regulation might operate in practice. So there is a distinction there in terms of the guidance note and the FAQs and their formal kind of legal status, if you like. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Um, we had uh, another question there, which related to, uh, from Colin Leonard also, I think, from what would an importer be required to show if importing non-relevant commodities, even if those products present the same combined nomenclature as the products made of relevant commodities? Again, I don't know, maybe if colleagues could, could maybe respond on that one. I, I would have thought the, the, the combined nomenclature, the CN code, is quite clear or quite specific in terms of the operation of the regulation as to what products it applies to. So I'm not sure what the circumstance would be of importing non-relevant commodities that may have have the same CN code. I don't know if colleagues have come across that here on, on our part in, in the department. Yeah, I don't mind taking that one, Paul. And there are, it, it, it's, a, it's a good question and thank you for it. And there are scenarios where some products would fall under a CN code, but they're not, they're not, they're made from, they're not made from the relevant commodities. So if you take the wood example, um, bamboo or rattan, um, do not fall under the scope of the regulation. So this type of scenario is actually addressed in detail in the FAQs. So there will be, um, if you like, a provision when you're making your customs declaration, as we understand it from our colleagues in revenue to state that the product is made um, from uh, material uh, that's not a relevant commodity. Um, but there is a very detailed response to that question in the FAQs. But certainly in the case of, 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 of say products made from bamboo or rattan, they would have the same CN code, but they wouldn't be made from wood. And that's catered for both in the regulation itself and also um, when the importer is, is um, completing their customs documentation. But there's, there's a longer answer um, that I would, would urge stakeholders interested in that subject to read in the FAQs as well. 
Okay, thanks, Patrick. Uh, we have another question there from Simon, Simon McKeever, um, asking about whether we consider the downstream implications to SMEs that may be caught in the earlier end of 2025 date for larger operators. So this would be where the smaller operators could be caught in, in that earlier part of 2025 because they're seeing an issue here with the CSRD, which I presume is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting uh, Directive. Um, I'm not sure what those specific implications might be, or, or again, I know Patrick or other colleagues might have a, an idea in terms of where we might see SMAs being caught in that first half of 2025 before the regulation becomes effective for them in June of 2025. But again, we could maybe in the context of our bilateral engagement with stakeholders, we might explore that question further. But I don't know if there's any comments that people want to make now at this stage. Yeah, I don't mind just jumping in there again, Paul. Just again, I would think a very valid question. I would refer um, people to question 9.1 in the frequently asked questions that uh, deals with a scenario of this nature. So um, as mentioned in the presentation, the regulation doesn't enter into application for a further six months for small and micro enterprises. So that's June 2026. And where a small and micro enterprise enterprise places a product on the EU market in that period, and that product is subsequently bought by a downstream operator, what the downstream operator has to do is just provide verifiable information that the product was placed on the market within that six month window by the small and micro enterprise. And if you go to question 9.2 on the FAQs, the commission provide examples of what that verifiable information might be. It could be a SAD from a customs declaration or a felling license that gives multiple examples across commodities. So it is, it is a, a scenario that definitely has received attention, but it is addressed in the FAQs. And if stakeholders have further questions following kind of examining that question, we'd be very keen to hear them so we can feed that back to the Commission. Okay, thanks Patrick. And I think Simon had a follow-up question there, but he has come back there to say that that does answer his question. So go to that uh, question nine in, in, the, the, uh, in the FAQs, I think is that what you said? Question nine in the guidance note? Yeah, in the FAQs, yeah. Okay, so that answers that point. Thank you very much for that. Um, there was also just a couple of other questions there. Um, where from Sarah Bell had a question in relation to that there only appeared to be five slots to enter in Polygon information, presumably that was obviously on the, the filling of the form. Will this change for importers? I'm not sure whether that's in relation to is, is the maximum that you can supply information in respect of on a particular form, five items, maybe that's what that's getting to there. Yeah, if it relates to the geolocation data, the question, the regulation sets out that um, the, the specificity of the of the latitude and longitude coordinates would be to four would be to uh, four decimal points. So that's set out in the regulation. But we can we can just double check that that's what the question relates to. Um, if if the colleague wants to email that into us, we can respond to them in, in more specific detail. But that uh, geolocation data. Uh, number of digits is set out in the regulation, so there's no need to give more. Uh, I suppose I suppose numerical points than the regulation requires. But if that's not what the question is asked, please come back to us and we we tease that out with you. Okay, and maybe they could get back to that EUDR agriculture.gov.ie central uh, email address. Okay, so Sarah, if, that's, if that hasn't answered the question, you could come back to us directly on that. Uh, there's also a question from David Johnson about whether a casing or a used tire destined for retreading would be in scope. Uh, I presume that's in the context of, of rubber or, or the application of the regulation to rubber as a commodity. Uh, again, I don't know whether one of my colleagues, Audrey, I think is on the call from, on, on that one. I don't know if there's anything specifically that you wanted to mention on that, Audrey, or anybody else. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, so what we did want to say generally about used tires was uh, we there's nothing we can do about the fact that the Commission has them uh, as part of the regulation, but I think we would like to dispute their inclusion um, in terms of 
the 2017 tire regulation it's they they may not conform with each other but but on the specific um the casing which we would need to know what the cn code for it is because i don't know the cn code for casings and i don't actually see it mentioned in annex one here in um in annex one okay, well, um, that might be one maybe audio that we could follow up again in, ter in terms of a direct contact just kind of to tease out that i'm not sure that it's dead but fully in the context of a broader answering and the guidance number that frequently asked questions it might be better something i think to to contact just directly on that as well okay, um, okay so i'm just going to the time because i'm not sure in a couple of minutes uh, audrey you might just mute your microphone there that'd be great thanks um there's a question in relation to traces about looking for help uh with uh around traces does each location need a cert that is loaded on traces and then referenced in the sad however, however each trailer could have 30 to 50 locations for where the wood was sourced that's from larissa Kiolan. that seems to be a particular question around wood again i don't know patrick or our colleagues on on forestry so do you want to refer to that or can we get maybe more information by way of direct follow-up on that as well i think yeah yeah we might we might discuss that one bilaterally there is there is a file size limit in terms of the size of um geojson files i think it's 25 megabytes but i'll double check that um in terms of geolocation data that can be uploaded at any one time um in terms of capacity um so that might partially partially address the question and in terms of registering on traces that's done automatically by by the operator it's an auto registration um mechanism um so some operators will be more familiar with the traces system than others and I, th I think that interaction with the information system for operators and and working through traces is definitely something that the next 12 months gives us the window to finesse and and hopefully make run more smoothly but um definitely if that uh, uh, stakeholder would like to email email us um if we don't if we haven't fully addressed the question there we'd be delighted to get to provide more detail as required thank you okay thanks patrick and uh, i'm just conscious of time here I, i'm not sure again whether whether the uh, the webinar right one to conclusion shortly but there's another question from tara mulrennan about clarifying the term x before the cn codes in annex one uh, anybody wants to comment on that? I'm not sure specifically what what uh, text we're looking at there. Yeah, that question is addressed in the FAQs as well um, in detail. So it's basically ex it, it, it's exclusive of certain products and commodities, a bit like what I mentioned in relation to the bamboo and rattan. And my colleague Colin might want to add a little bit on that question. Colin, if you'd like to. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Just I suppose it's it's similar to what you said earlier that um, you know if 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 a product may may be listed in Annex One, um, but it may not include the commodity. So, like you said, uh, if if somebody was importing seats or chairs um, that weren't necessary, so wood is the commodity there. But if the wood or if the chair or seat doesn't doesn't include wood. Then it's outside the scope of the regulation and, and doesn't uh, doesn't come under it. So, for example, if the if the chair was made of bamboo or rattan, like you said, um, that would be that would be excluded from that particular HS code and wouldn't be outside the scope. Okay, thanks, Colin. Uh, I think that was all the questions. Sarah has come back. Sarah Bell just um, expanding there to say it was the fact that there was only five lines to enter the geolocation data. In the DDS form, I know you, you were talking in terms of the number of carriages. I think Patrick, they might have been allowed in there. So, so again, maybe Sarah, we might follow up that one um, directly with you if you want to come back to that central email address to us, eudr.agriculture.gov.ie, uh, and we'll come back to you and maybe flesh that one out a bit more. But I think that uh, uh, was at least partially covered, I think, by Patrick's response earlier. Uh, I see another question here for from Martina Cavana just come in there on. Uh, for multinational companies located in the EU who have entities in many countries, can the DDS be done centrally in one country or two, must it be done in each EU country which imports and exports? 
So if they're located in the EU but, but have entities in many countries, can the DDS be done centrally in one country or must it be done in each EU country which imports and exports? Uh, so again, I mean, I would have thought, uh, I don't know, Patrick Rose might want to comment, but this is around the first time that a product is placed on the single market. And once it's done at that point, the DDS is produced at that point, then it effectively travels with the product until it may be transformed into some other product covered by Annex 1 by the, by the CN codes, at which point a new due diligence statement would, would be required. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, Paul, that is fair to say. And I would also um, direct the questioner as well. It's slightly related to our question, but just a clarification given around multiple shipments in the FAQs that I, I reference in one of the slides um, in, in the presentation. And so that gives, I suppose, a, a, an assistance to operators who are who are who are placing significant volumes of product on the EU market. So, so that, that FAQ around multiple shipments and other related questions of the FAQs, I think, help tease out that situation. But absolutely, as you said, it's where the product is placed on the EU market for the first time that it needs to be accompanied by a due diligence statement. I might just add there as well that, that I suppose it's important to, to point out that it's the uh, largely the, the person or the entity who's listed as importer on the on the SAD document um, that would be would, would be responsible for for uploading the due diligence statement, um, and subsequently then the first uh, company established in the EU after that who places that product in the on the EU market is also responsible for for submitting a due, due diligence statement to the information system as well. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Thanks for that clarification too. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I think that was all the questions that we have uh, that have been submitted um, to date. Um, we have kind of run up against our time, I think, on on the webinar as well. So, if there aren't any further questions from anybody, then I think we might just draw proceedings to a close there. Um, and other than just maybe to remind everybody that uh, look, although the deferment is in place now, we will be or is, is the arrangements are being made, if you like, for the deferral to take place, subject to the process at European Parliament level as well that we mentioned earlier. But um, for the moment, at least from our perspective, we are going to continue on with the preparations with the same intensity as before. Uh, we do intend to have a further webinar as we had intended previously on the 16th of December. So that'll be on the 16th of December. Uh, and we'll set out then the dates for subsequent webinars at that point for moving into 2025. So we'll give you dates for, for subsequent seminars or webinars at that stage. Again, I'd, I'd kind of echo uh, Patrick's comments from earlier on, which is to really, if you could, uh, to familiarise yourself now with the FAQs and the guidance note that have been issued by the Commission. Uh, but we think that a combination of the two things now really should probably answer pe most of people's questions and certainly should form the basis for uh, everybody's preparations at this point, or at least the starting of those preparations. And what we'd like to be able to do in our, in our further engagement with everybody over the coming months would be to, again, focus in on particular questions that we may have arising from that latest information that we've got. Are there further gaps? Are there further issues that people want to identify that are not covered by the FAQs or the guidance note? Uh, and that will form the basis of the uh, the engagement from our perspective. While we're also working in the background on some of the things that Patrick mentioned in terms of trying to facilitate the sector as best we can to make data available that might make the process of complying with the regulation more straightforward. So we'll continue with that work in the background. And as I say, if you can familiarize yourselves with uh, the detail that we've now shared with you um, that's been given by the Commission, I think that would be very helpful in terms of focusing the preparations and focusing discussions, hopefully in a much more detailed way uh, as we go through the arrangements over the next few months. So apart from the webinar on the 16th, I mentioned earlier, we will do some further bilateral contacts with people as well, with stakeholders, with, with representative organisations that are on the call today. Uh, we will be in touch with people on that front uh, over the next, uh, probably the next week or two, I would imagine, next couple of weeks, because we'd hope to do something on that front maybe in the early part of December, before the next webinar on the 16th. So we'll be in touch with uh, all of the representative organisations on that shortly to make arrangements there. Uh, so I think um, I think that's everything. Again, no further questions have come in in the meantime. So uh, with my thanks to all of my colleagues here in the department for, for joining us, uh, and uh, thanks everybody as well for tuning in to the webinar this afternoon. I think we'll leave it at that and say goodbye, and we'll see you on the 16th of December, if not before. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.